Great seeing all of you this morning. What a blessing to be here, and what a blessing to have uh, this sword in our hands and open it. And I ask you to open it now to Luke chapter 8. Apologies for getting the outline out late to you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alan. Um, the ti- I put a title on uh, the lesson, Wordy as Usual, Fledgling Faith Meets Compassionate Power. I hope that will come to the fore as we, as we read the passage and get into it. But our passage this morning, it's going to conclude the eighth chapter, finds Jesus and his uh, disciples uh, returning across the sea, probably to Capernaum. Uh, from the land of the Gerasenes, where he had delivered the demon-possessed men from the legion of uh, demons oppressing them. Soon after, remember, uh, the citizens of that community had begged Jesus to depart from them. Uh, That's in contrast to these in the the region of Capernaum who are going to heartily welcome Jesus. So as our passage opens, the Lord has... Uh, consecutively uh, calmed uh, the raging sea. He's cast out these demons. He's defeated uh, Satan, showing that he is both master of nature and master of uh, the satanic world. Today, he'll prove to be the master over sickness and death as well, as we will see in a maelstrom of pathos and desperate action. Two distinct but remarkably similar pitiful people each connect with the mighty Savior in ways that are seemingly at odds uh, with the plight of uh, the other one, a a synagogue official whose daughter uh, was on the verge of death and a desperate woman uh, suffering for years with, with a hemorrhage. All three synoptic gospels uh, include the account in a way underscoring its importance and out of their telling of these intertwined stories of each, we're led to observe four important, um, really marvelous truths come together. The compassionate love of Jesus for the miserable. Isn't that wonderful to know, to learn that when we are miserable and sometimes we are, Uh, He has compassion for us. Uh, His divine power uh, to come to our aid at those times and all times. His providence in arranging their circumstances. And lastly, the important conjunction of all that with their halting faith. Jesus is uh, the God-man. Therefore, he is the unique man with power unlimited and love unfathomable. There is no limit to his power. Uh, Pascal wrote that the greatest distinguishing feature of the omnipotence of God is that our imagination gets lost when thinking about it. And his love is limitless and irresistible. Another has written, the love of God is like the Amazon River flowing down to water one daisy. Well, in our passage, the two come together. So we're going to read uh, beginning with verse 40 to the end of the chapter. A familiar passage, uh, I know. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the the crowds were pressing against him. And that's going to be significant to our story, as you remember Wherever he ran into Jairus, soon there were crowds uh, pressing uh, against him. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone uh, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately 
her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and, and, and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had, had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down, trembling for a multitude of, of reasons. Um, she had been an outcast because of her condition. So she comes trembling uh, and she fell down before this man who had healed her. And she declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter and James and John and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and, and lamenting for her. Uh, but I think we're to think of these professional mourners. They were all weeping and lamenting for her, but he said, stop weeping for she has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. Uh, people laughed at Jesus. Uh, what, a, what a sad thing. Uh, they laughed at him. Have you ever been laughed at? I mean, you may have to go all the way back to elementary school to remember someone laughing at you. But they, they began uh, laughing at Jesus, knowing that she had died. He, however, took her by the hand and called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up immediately, and he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he instructed them not to tell no one what had happened. A common occurrence, Jesus had his finger on the pulse of where he was, when he was there, and what faced him in the future. Well, the scene in Capernaum, we think it was Capernaum when Jesus was uh, returned, was electrified at a time in history, absent the immediacy of news spreading worldwide at the click of a send uh, button. Only the most important events raced from village to village. This past uh, fortnight, use that word intentionally, uh, we all probably were made aware of the death of Queen Elizabeth II within three or four hours uh, after it uh, had happened, after she had passed. Uh, so urgent and important was it to announce it to the world. And here, it seems, news somehow had traveled almost as fast. News about the commanding authority of this rabbi's uh, teaching, about his mounting miraculous healings and of power over menacing demons. Uh, hordes then of people uh, sought him out when he returned, pressing in upon him as he went about. They had been, have you ever seen a politician at a fundraiser or some event and uh, they walk in and people whoop, come, come, come up to him. I think that's what was, was happening uh, here. Uh, so they were pressing in upon him, and they had been feverishly waiting for him uh, in the early chapters of the gospel, uh, of the gospels. It's always the people. Uh, the people clamored after him, uh, eventually reminding us that once he had been popular, uh, though for misguided reasons. Well, here they'd been waiting for him to arrive, and, and they turned out in droves uh, to welcome him and a man named Jairus, uh, Luke says, fought his way through the crowds to come to him. Uh, Jairus was an official of the synagogue, which meant that he was the man 
uh, responsible for arranging the schedule uh, of the meeting, the schedules of the meetings, uh, who, who would speak and, and who would read and arranging uh, the services. He was uh, tasked with those things. So he was a man of eminence uh, in the synagogue, certainly, but uh, therefore in the community. Uh, this day, he's a desperate um, man. This day, he is a desperate man. His little daughter, uh, 12 years old, is sick to the point of death. We must assume that he had tried uh, everything that could be done to restore her health, just like you and I would do, but nothing had worked. And now, in desperation, he has seized this opportunity to come to Jesus. It's possible their paths had crossed uh, before, as Jesus had taught in uh, the synagogue, and perhaps Jairus had witnessed the healing of the paralytic that uh, Luke uh, recorded in uh, chapter 5 of the gospel or some other sick person. In any event, he comes to Jesus and he falls down before him with a desperate plea that he come to his house. His daughter was dying. That's what Luke tells us. His daughter was dying and Jairus believed Jesus could save her. She was his only uh, daughter. And Mark records, I'm going to quote a bit from Mark in our lesson today. Mark has sort of a fuller um, exposition of, of, of what happened. So Mark records in his gospel the tenderness with which Jairus refers to her. She's my little daughter, just like we would do. She's my little daughter. There are a lot of really difficult things that can happen to us in this life, uh, but losing a child is surely one of the very worst. Uh, you know, having a baby and then nurturing her and watching her grow, experiencing with her all the little steps of progress that she attains, uh, seeing her smile uh, for the first time and loving every time she smiles, watching her learn, hurting with her when she uh, cries, anticipating all the different rites of passage that little human beings go through. It's a roller coaster of joys and fears and laughter, which is one of the greatest rides of, of life that a person can em embark on. But part of the love for a child is the knowledge of how fragile her life is and how small is the margin between joy and devastation. Jairus and his wife were on the precipice of devastation. He had come to Jesus out of desperation as a last resort to try to stave off what looked to be a heartbreaking end, and Jesus responded. Uh, Luke says in verse 42, in his abbreviated fashion, simply that Jesus went. He, he recognized that here was a man with a great need, so he went with Jairus. But as he went, the crowds, the crowds were pressing against him. And the challenge now was to fight through the crowds and get him to her before it was too late. Streets were quite narrow in these ancient uh, cities. Uh, wherever he met Jairus, they were going to his house now, and his house apparently was in the city. And so a crowd such as this meant that there would be a kind of crush of the crowd pressing in on Jesus that Peter, in verse 45, will describe as he protests. And that's when there came the unexpected delay, uh, the interruption that would vex the synagogue official, but serve as a springboard for the Son of God to reveal his power, wisdom, and love in an even more striking way. A woman came up to Jesus, and it brought their hurried progress to a halt, uh, which had to have been the most frustrating to Jairus and only added to his anxiety uh, Luke simply says that the woman had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone. Was it a coincidence that the man with the 12-year-old daughter is now delayed by a woman who has 
continued for 12 years in her suffering. Perhaps, we don't know. I say more likely it was a signal of God's providence in providing the occasion for the manifestation of that providence and his compassionate power to merge with the imperfect faith of both of these. The woman suffered from a hemorrhage. Whatever the cause or source of it, it meant that she suffered from a persistent and unwanted flow of blood and the consequences of that would have been uh, awful. According to the law, Leviticus chapter 15, a flow of blood like this rendered a person ritually unclean. And since this was a chronic condition, been going on for 12 years, she had been living her life as an outcast. She was in a constant state of uncleanness and would have been shunned by others since contact with someone who was unclean uh, subjected them uh, to be considered unclean. Mark enlarges on her distress. He says that for all these years she had tried everything, seeing every physician that she could, draining all the financial resources, just like you and I would do, draining all the financial resources she had, only to see her condition not improve, but instead grow worse. Her life had been completely ruined and she was desperate. Alone, alienated from ordinary social interaction. If she had ever been married, that marriage was probably over. She had heard about Jesus, but was afraid to come out into the open. And yet as a last resort, she came looking for him, thinking that if she could just touch his garments, she would be made better. It was an impressive faith. Not a perfect faith. Uh, there was part superstition in it, surely, thinking as was prevalent in these days that uh, the power of a person could be transmitted by touching his garments, but it had gotten her to, her to this place. She would uh, merely touch, not really the garment even itself, but one of the four uh, woolen tassels every Israelite was to wear on the corner of his square outer uh, robe, uh, meant to remind the is faithful Israelite of, of God's law. Intent on keeping her actions hidden, she snuck up behind him and brushed her hand against the swinging tufts at the back of his robe. Two very different people. Uh, Jairus represented the privileged who rejected Jesus, but who in desperation uh, turned to him for help because none other could. She represented the lowly who rejected uh, Jesus and who turned to him in desperation because none other would or could. Uh, Twelve years of delight, this man uh, with his little girl at, at his side. In the same span, twelve years of misery, uh, now on the verge of reversal. But both had exhausted every resource and every other recourse. Both had reached the end of their rope and were more desperate than they had ever been. Both hoped that what they wanted to be true about Jesus, that he had the power to heal in himself, really was true. Could it, she'd heard about it, was it true? Uh, both had an imperfect understanding of both Jesus and his power. According to Mark's account, Jairus wanted Jesus to lay hands on his uh, daughter. She looked to touch his, his garment, but in the case of both, uh, Jesus responded uh, favorably, following after uh, Jairus in haste to his daughter, then looking uh, for this woman in order to affirm her faith. So uh, for both, Jesus had compassion, taking their small, imperfect faith and responding to it, strengthening it 
uh, by his love and healing mercy. The woman experienced it first after she touched his cloak. Luke says in verse 44 that immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Mark adds that she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Can you imagine? She felt in her body that she was healed. So that's another way of saying she knew after 12 years she was healed. Can you imagine how thrilled she was? What a relief <coughs> this was. It was the greatest day of her life and she must have been bursting with elation, with, with joy. She felt it. She was healed at last. The same power that we saw had calmed uh, the winds and the sea, had rescued this woman from a 12-year-long agony. Jesus felt something too. Uh, to the woman and to those who would later hear of it, her cure might have appeared to have come about by some kind of magic. You know, pick a card, any card. Touch a tassel, any tassel. But what follows, put the lie to any such notion. The Lord would not have it because he himself was completely aware of what had taken place. And now he would bring the woman to see that it was her faith in God which had led to the cure. And so he asked the strange question in verse 45, looking about him, who is the one who touched me? And you can imagine how those around uh, would react when challenged like that by the daunting Lord Jesus Christ. Not me. I did not touch you. Peter, however, always the exception, uh, seemed irked by the, the question. Uh, Mark's account again is fuller. Peter rebukes him. You see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? They knew what the most important thing was on their agenda at the moment. It was a, to get this important man, this very eminent man, to his house as quickly as possible to give help to his dying daughter. And, and with the crowd, the going was difficult. I'm sure many of you, I know many of you are, are sport fans and you've experienced what it's like uh, to go to the big game. Uh, big time college football game at an old stadium like the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. And the last time I went, for me, it would be a Texas Oklahoma game. That'd be the game that I'd want to go to. And I remember the last time uh, I did that, it's been a few years, but uh, fighting my time to go to the game, time for kickoff, and you walk into up the steps in the crowd and you get into the concourse and uh, pretty soon you're surrounded by people who don't seem as urgent as you are to get into the stadium and find the seat and they're shoving and you, you're paralyzed and it, you, you start to panic. I, it, not that you're not going to see kickoff or find your seat, but you might not survive <laughs> uh, being there. So here Jairus and his disciples were, they were leading interference uh, for Jesus uh, through the crowd, pressing in from every direction in order to get that little girl, to get to that little girl. And Jesus stops and asks, who touched him? It irritated Peter. And his reproach showed a lack of respect. But the Lord ignored him. Uh, because he had something more important in mind at the moment. He said, someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. Now, that's a very interesting thing. I'm sure you've thought that too as you've read this. I was aware that power had gone out of me. How a woman could come up behind Jesus, unbeknownst to him, who touched me, unbeknownst to him, touch his clothing, feel the healing come to her through his healing power, and Jesus would himself feel the transmission of that power. How could it happen? 
how could the God-man, uh, ignorant in his humanity of what had transpired, nevertheless release the power to heal that was his by virtue of his deity? I hope this helps. So consider this. Jesus was hungry in the wilderness. He'd fasted for 40 days. Uh, he would not turn the stones uh, into bread. He could have, couldn't he? He could have turned the stones into bread. He had the power to do that. Jesus knew which disciple would betray him. He could have stopped him, but he didn't. They mocked him on the cross, saying he saved himself, he saved others, why can't he save himself? He could have, uh, but he would not. So the answer, I think, is found in his mission, always. His mission was the perfecting of people of faith. The perfecting of people of faith. That was to be accomplished on the cross. And this woman, uh, no matter in what rudimentary form her faith was in, she was a woman of faith. And, as, and Christ's power was released upon her in response to her faith, as fledgling as it was. As William Lane put it, Lane was one of the great commentators on the Gospel of Mark. As Lane put it, the healing of the woman occurred through God's free and gracious decision to bestow upon her the power which was active in Jesus. I like that, that phrase, to bestow on her the power which was active in Jesus. By an act of sovereign will, God determined to honor the woman's faith in spite of the fact that it was tinged with ideas which bordered on magic. And Jesus wanted her to understand that. He wanted her to understand that. So he said to her in verse 48, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Uh, the suffering woman had uh, been desperately in want of peace. And now her healing opened the way to peace and her faith had been the channel through which that healing had taken place. Not the fleeting brush of her hand against Jesus' garment, but the faith from which that action was born. And it was Jesus' personal response to her personal faith in him that had cured her. God honors faith. Uh, even little, bitsy, teeny weeny faith. Uh, God honors uh, faith. Now think about yourself. I've asked this question to this group before. Think about your own experience in coming to know the Lord and how God blessed your own faith. Did you have all the facts right? Did you understand exactly how God was saving you? Did you? That, that night for me? No. Uh, I didn't understand it at all. I suspect very few of, of you did. Uh, had you first tried everything else? Were you in trouble and at the end of your rope? Were you desperate? Uh, God uses desperate situations in the lives of his people. Isn't that encouraging? He uses the desperate times in our lives. He did in mine. I've looked back on my conversion and I've often thought, uh, did I trust did I just trust in Christ in order to rescue me from the mess that I'd gotten myself in? And I think partially the answer is yes. Help, <laughs> help me. But that was only the beginning, see? Like, like this woman, uh, Christ doesn't leave us in our ignorance or in our uh, selfishness. He honors the faith we have, but then he instructs our faith. And over time, he brings it to a mature uh, state, a more mature, a more mature con condition of faith. But then came the dread news in verse 49. Uh, while he was still speaking, at the very moment, 
Someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. So the words were still on uh, Jesus' lips. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What a, what a, what a, what a time of rejoicing. Hallelujah. Uh, her, she was well. And everyone knew it. Uh, Jairus uh, witnessed it. But now what arguably should have been an incentive to this anxious father instead seemed only a fatal interruption, and indeed a, a terminal one. This was the conclusion uh, of it all, or so it seemed. But when Jesus heard the news and recognizing the blow that it would be to Jairus, he quickly instructs his dwindling faith and in verse 50, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she will be made well. If he'll only believe, the little girl will be restored. Uh, what the woman with the hemorrhage had just experienced through faith, he could experience as well. So I hope you feel it, the struggle that we all have with faith with prayer. If, if you'll only believe, you can experience what this woman just believed. It was a call for intense faith. I think it was a call for supernatural uh, faith. He had had hope that perhaps Jesus, who had healed others who were sick or suffered from uh, various maladies, could heal his sick daughter, but now things had completely changed. Uh, now she was no longer sick. She was dead. She had died. Uh, surely it was too late. Uh, they were right. Why trouble him anymore? Why, uh, why waste everybody's time? Why keep up the commotion? For Jairus, now he was being asked to go a step beyond the faith in the healing ability of Jesus and exercise faith in the face of death. His, his faith needs to kick in the gear. What the Lord does next is both fascinating and mysterious. When he had healed the woman, he had done it before everyone, before the eyes of uh, the multitude. Uh, this illustrated his mercy, if you think about it, because it was important for the woman. Uh, unclean in the eyes of all for so many years. She was the unclean woman. Stay, uh, stay away. It was important uh, to, for her to benefit from the full publicity of her cleansing. But now there was to be a resurrection. And Jesus singles out only the girl's father and mother and for the first time, that trio, that famous trio, Peter, James, and John, to accompany him into the room where the child's dead body had been laid. And we learn something here. God's view of different, God's view of death is different than humans. Jesus will reinterpret it from the point of view of God. But first, having arrived at the house, uh, this typical Eastern morning scene is already in uh, full display and the, with the hired mourners and all the wailing and weeping and Jesus rebukes them, stop weeping for she has not died but is asleep. Uh, only Jesus, only Jesus among all those who were there that day, truly understood the truth of that. He was the master of death, and he knew that death is not so much related to the physical body as it is to the separation of the soul from God. And this he intended to prevent now. Uh, thus, he was interpreting death from God's viewpoint. The comment, though, inspired much levity at his expense. They, they began laughing at him. But Jesus is, is in no mood uh, for it. The man who would one day weep 
uh, at the tomb of Lazarus, even though he knew he was going to call him forth from, from, from the tomb and he would emerge uh, alive. Here he feels the same kind of disgust and sorrow at the obvious pain and despair of death. And so Mark records that he put them all out, put them all out. And then they entered the room where the child was, and the Lord, according to verse 54, took the little girl by the hand and called out to her saying, child, arise. I love that. And her spirit revived, Luke writes, and what was once only a dead body responded as all the living do. She got up immediately, perhaps I would say enthusiastically, and Jesus directed that something, that she be given something to eat. She'd been through an ordeal. This, this 12-year-old had been through quite the ordeal, and Jesus intended to refresh her now. Child arise is what Luke records Jesus said to her. Child, arise. Of course, that's Greek translated into English. But Mark, in his gospel, uh, provides the words in Aramaic as Jesus would have actually spoken them. Talitha kum, a little girl get up. Talitha kum, little girl get up. And, Luke, primarily writing, maybe remember for a, a Gentile audience, omits that and simply gives the Greek translation. But here's the interesting thing. Peter was there. So Peter, uh, who would become the famous apostle, uh, much used by the Lord, he witnessed what happened that day in this little girl's uh, room. And years later, would be personally faced with a similar sad scene. At Joppa, in Acts chapter 9, there was a disciple named Tabitha, revered by all. Remember? Also known as Dorcas, Tabitha. She fell sick. She died. They called for Peter. They'd heard that he was in the region. And when he arrived, and perhaps remembering this scene, this conjecture, but he arrived, maybe he remembered uh, this scene. And he knelt down and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. In Aramaic, that would have been Tabitha kum. Almost the same phonetically as what he heard this day come out of the Lord's mouth in Aramaic, Talitha kum. Tabitha kum. And in like manner, faithful Tabitha, Tabitha, opened her eyes, saw Peter, sat up, and was presented alive to those that loved her at the church at Joppa. Peter, remember, was the main source it's almost certain, for Mark's gospel. Isn't that interesting? And so Mark records exactly what Jesus said in that room that day, Talitha kum. But here in Jairus' household, there must have been a sense of remarkable joy, but also awe at what Jesus had accomplished for them. What a whirlwind of events as we bring this to an end. Uh, only God could have orchestrated such a chain of circumstances and brought them all to such providential uh, blessings. A daughter in critical condition, a woman uh, shamefully suffering from a severe disease, hope kindled, hope dashed, the woman restored, the child brought back to life. Uh, the common elements in all were the fledgling and imperfect faith of the sufferers and the compassionate power of our Savior, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. What little faith we have, what imperfect faith. Some of you have more faith than me. So, some, uh, some of you have more faith uh, than others, but all of us 
have weak, imperfect faith, that God is being faithful to nurture and to uh, mend, perhaps to restore faith that has gone dormant, uh, faith that has drifted almost to unbelief because of the frustration of not seeing what you think the answer to your prayer uh, should be. But God, in his unlimited power, is taking that faith and he's strengthening it day by day with some dips here and there. And uh, what a savior he is. Let me close with this old hymn that gives us all a good response. The love of Christ passes knowledge. The love of Christ eases fear. The love of Christ hits a man's heart. It pierces him like a spear. Savior, let thy love be felt. Let its power be felt by me. Then my frozen heart shall melt, melt in love, O Lord, to thee. Let that be our prayer. Father, thank you for this inspiring passage of Scripture. Uh, we believe it. Uh, so so there, we, we as a class at Believer's Chapel today confess that we believe this. Uh, we confess uh, our, our imperfect faith, but we rejoice in the certainty that you are all loving, all compassionate, all powerful, and you are able to uh, overcome uh, our imperfections and restore us, save us, see us through uh, to the very end uh, to glory. Thank you. Uh, go with us now. Bless uh, our service that's coming up. Bless Dan as he preaches. Uh, give us all uh, an another opportunity to come face to face with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.